focus more on the passage leading up to that and what was taking place, what had transpired. And this has been a, a passage of scripture that in a lot of ways has been a, a model to me over the years in understanding some things. Like I said, where do you go in time of trouble? When you run into the brick wall, so to speak, or you run into this kind of obstacle or this kind of problem, where do you turn? And I'll share a little bit about that here this morning about where we turn. Because it's very significant where we turn in life. And uh, it's one of the things I'll share a little bit, probably a little bit later. As a pastor, one of the things you learn about people is where they turn in time to trouble and how they act in time to trouble determines a lot about where they are with the Lord and their walk with God. Uh, it's easy to, to live a certain way without pressure. But pressure changes everybody. You know, I, I've been part of sports and followed sports now a lot, all my life. And one of the sayings I always had about athletes is everybody changes under pressure. Nobody's ever the same. You either get better or you get worse under pressure. But nobody stays the same. And the people that we consider in history to be great athletes usually are not necessarily great athletes because they do something so much better than everybody else all the time, but because they do it better under pressure. There are certain athletes who get better, the more pressure their dog is, the better they perform. And there's other athletes who will perform well up to a certain level, and then they'll just fall apart when the pressure comes. And you see that a lot in life with people. There's a lot of people who, who their walk with God, their relationship with God is great, but as soon as pressure comes, everything changes. And they throw everything they're learning out the window and go back to their own way of living. Or vice versa. Some people, when the pressure comes, they immediately begin to, to draw closer to God. <coughs> what we see here in this passage, it's just kind of a little bit of lead up to it, is um, the, the church is just very new at this time. They just began in the sense that Christ has just been uh, resurrected. Acts chapter 2 has been the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, what we refer to as the day of Pentecost. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are going up to the temple to pray, and they stop and, and they basically, there's a lame man that's miraculously healed in the name of Jesus. And when that takes place, then the people who were in power at that time get very upset with that. And they call Peter and John in before the, the magistrates and before the court, basically, and they chastised him for having done this and seeing this man healed in the name of Jesus. So when they chastised him, they commanded him to preach or teach them, and no more in the name of Jesus, and then they released him. And so immediately the church is just new, it's just began, and one of the first things they do, they see this great miracle, and I'm sure they were jubilant and, and just full of joy, but immediately opposition waits them because of it. Immediately they run into trouble. Immediately the church is tested. It's just like as a, as a believer, a lot of times people will come to Christ and immediately they face some obstacles. Immediately they face some tests. So right now we see the church for the first time in many ways under a great deal of pressure. And how do they respond? How do they handle pressure, so to speak? Let's go back to verse uh, 23, and that's where I'm going to pick up. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. So being let go, they went to their own company. The first thing they did, they, they went to their own company. And I, and I thought, you know, that's really significant because when people get into trouble, they go to their own company. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more and expound upon that a little bit more. But they go to their people. You see, so that will tell you a lot who your people are. That will tell you a lot who your company is. Some people, they get in trouble and, and they immediately run back to trouble. Some people get into trouble, they immediately run to God's people. They chose to go to God's people. They chose to go what the Bible refers to as their own company. You know, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit right now about that word company. And you might say, well, Pastor, why would you take just one word and focus on it so much? But the Bible tells us that all the scripture is inspired by God. The Bible tells us that, 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 you know, just like the Moses, when Moses was on the mountaintop in the glory cloud, God said, you know, sit down and write these words. So God's specific about words. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians that, that, that God spoke just with words. 
So if, if God specifically picks out a word by the Holy Spirit, specifically records a word, then we ought to specifically study a word. Because there's a lot to learn just from one word. There's a lot to learn just from that one basic word, company. Company. And, and I found it kind of interesting, and you know me, I get kind of fascinated with words sometimes. But the Greek language is so much more precise than the English language. And I forget now exactly how many English words are actually translated. I mean, I mean, how many Greek words are translated company in the Bible. I think it's 13 or 14 different Greek words. And I began to look at it. You know, there's a lot of different ways that we can be in a group. There's a lot of different ways we can be in a company. I mean, you can go out here and, and you can have a traffic jam. And you can just have a random group of people. And that's a group though, isn't it? There's a group of people there at the, at the traffic jam. They have no connection whatsoever, nothing in common, but there's a group of people. I mean, you can go out here and we can have the parking lot full of people and we can all go stand in the parking lot and there could be a group of people Say, well, there's a group over there in the parking lot. You can have a company of people for a lot of different ways. You can have a group of people that are co-workers. You can have a, a group of people that are maybe family. But it says here that Peter and John went to their company. Well, why was that their company? Why was that their group? Why was that their people? Why were they they're the ones? And when you look at that word, the Greek word that is company there, it, it's one own people. Just like you have your own opinion. You have your own stuff. You have your own home. You have your own family. You know, you have your own shoes, whatever. You have things that belong to you and are specifically yours. And this is that word company there. This is specifically their people. This is specifically their group. Well, what do they have in common? You know, are they, they all make the same amount of money? Are they all the same education level? Are they all the, 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 the same height, the, you know, that have the same DNA? There's all kinds of things there, but that's not what they had in common. They were their own company because they were the, the church, the body of Christ, the people that God had put together. You see, they joined that company by placing faith in Jesus Christ. And they placed their faith in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're born again. So that's the first step of becoming part of that company. Now they're part of the body of Christ. But what does God do then? God then puts pieces together. And I've kind of been fascinated with this lately, how God puts pieces together. And I was sharing with some other pastors yesterday morning at a breakfast that was having with, with several other pastors. And, and I was talking to them about that. And I thought, you know, how the world sees things is the exact opposite of how God sees things. The world sees a company, a group of people put together because of common things. You know, you might have a group of people and they hang out together because they all make more money, you know, more than $100,000 a year, so they have that in common. You might have other people who, who have $20,000 or less income, so they have that in common, so they, they're a group of people. You might have another group of people who, who like golf or something, or you know they like basketball, or they like to play pool, or what have you. They, 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 there's a common ground there, but, but God doesn't put us together on the basis of our common ground. That's not how the kingdom of God works. God puts the pieces together. He had put these pieces together, and Peter and John went to their own company. And I'll guarantee you, when they walked in there, it was probably a diverse group. It was probably the, the wealthy people, and, and probably some poor people, and, and probably some educated people, and probably some uneducated people, and, and so on and so forth. It was probably a very diverse group. But it was their own company, not because they had the same DNA. It was their own company, not because they had this common interest. It was their own company, not because they, they, they maybe made the same amount of money. It was their own company because they were born again and put together as a body of Christ. But it was a very distinct company that was their own company, their own people. You see, we, we have to assume by looking at the rest of the scripture that, that probably these people were their prey. They were not probably there praying on behalf of Peter and John. Just like in Acts chapter 12, we see the same thing that Peter did. I mean, when Peter was thrown in jail again, when we found the church, they, they got together and they began to pray and call upon God. And, and we know the account, the story, that an angel went and, and got Peter out of his trouble and he was released and everything was fine. But the church, that own company 
of Peter's had gathered together and began to pray. And began to turn to God for that. And I thought, you know, that's something I want in life. I mean, if I get in trouble, I want people to be my company who are going to pray for me. I want people to be my company who are really going to pray for me. I mean, they're not just going to say, Pastor, God bless you, we love you, pat me on the back, say, we're going to pray for you, but they don't pray for me. You know, there's a lot of that that goes on. We pat people back, say, well, God bless you, Lord, I'm going to pray for you. Well, God bless the Lord. But I want people that's going to do like they did there in the early church. They got together and they began to pray. And they prayed until Peter was released. They, I believe that's what's going on here. They, their company has gathered together and said, hey, Peter, John's in trouble. We need to get together and we need to bind together and we need to pray and we need to call upon the name of the Lord because our brothers are in Christ are in trouble. That was their own company. That was their own company. They began to get together and they began to pray. But notice there again what they did. It says they, they came and they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Now, this is one of those things that if you don't stop and consider biblically what's taking place here, it makes no sense at all. I mean, can you imagine praying for somebody who's been lame all of their life, they're healed, they're rejoicing, praise God, glory to God, running around, perfectly healed, great miracle, and religious people get mad at you. And say, don't ever do that again. What is wrong with them? Can you imagine telling somebody that goes in, can you imagine being in a hospital and there, there's somebody there, they're on their deathbed, and you pray for them, they're miraculously healed, and they say, don't you ever pray like that again. What's wrong with those people? And telling them that you will never, ever preach or teach in the name of Jesus again, because when you did that, that lame man was healed. We're not going to put up with that. What is wrong with those people? That doesn't make sense, does it? I mean, it's hard to believe that the hardest, coldest human being on this planet would be against somebody being healed. Why would anybody be against a sick person being healed? That just absolutely doesn't make sense. But you see, when we examine the Bible, we study the Bible, we learn some stuff, don't we? You know, they're, they're the same. Back years ago when I used to, to be a faith of the love, and we dealt, dealt sometimes with bizarre behaviors. And I used to have a saying, I used to always tell the staff there, I said, you know what? There's always a reason for behavior. And you know what there is? If you see somebody's behavior and it doesn't make sense to you, that means you don't know something. There's something you don't understand about that life because there's a reason for behavior. And, and we use a lot because one of the things we had to monitor the residents for and stuff was drug use and alcohol use. So if all of a sudden they're acting different, there's a reason they're acting different. And when somebody does something this bizarre, there's a reason they're doing that. Maybe at that time, and, and if you don't dig into the Word of God a little bit and, and examine a little bit, Scripturally, you think that doesn't make sense, but there's a reason they did that. You see, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. You see, we look at the world today and we think, you know what? That don't make sense. Somebody in Las Vegas getting in a room with a bunch of guns and killing a bunch of people doesn't make sense. They say, why would any, what would ever do that? I'll tell you what would do that. A demon from hell will do that. Yeah. 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 There's a spirit behind, for, spiritual forces behind this stuff. Right. Yeah. There's something taking place here. And why would somebody be against somebody being healed? They weren't against that man being healed. If you'll notice it, it say, don't you ever go pray, pray for anybody to be healed again. Very specifically said, they were against them preaching or teaching in the name of Jesus. So they didn't say don't heal anybody. Just don't do it in the name of Jesus. You see the Bible, let me read the scripture to you. Go to 1 John chapter 4. Let's chew on this a minute. Figure this out. 1 John chapter 4. Three. 
says, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So there's a spirit fighting against Jesus in this world very actively. Now, it's, if you pay attention to different things, there's all kinds of things in our society that shows us that may be place. Not just the, 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 the bloody slaughters and all of that stuff. But, you know, the, the people getting mad because the Ten Commandments hang on the courthouse wall. Why does that upset somebody? I mean, even if you don't believe that, why does that bother you that it's there? You know, if, if I walk past somebody and they got some kind of little Buddhist thing out there, and I'm not going to work and get worked up about it. You know, they've got some other thing there, it doesn't bother them. But when it's something that's connected with Jesus, people get upset with it. Now, why do they get mad because somebody puts a little manger seed in your her property? A little bitty fake baby. Why does that upset somebody? You can put a fake baby of anybody else out there. Say, look at that little baby. Do you get one good look at you when he's a baby? Nobody's going to get mad about that, are they? Why do they get mad when it has to do with Jesus? Why do they get mad when you put a cross up in there somewhere? What is that spirit that's making everybody direct toward Jesus? Well, the goofiest ones, is the most obvious thing in our society that I see with this, and I've heard this a million times, separation of church and state. Okay, let me explain something to you. Let's use this as a point of illustration. First of all, there's nothing in the Constitution that says anything about separation of church and state. If you don't believe me on that, go read the Constitution. I challenge you to come back and show me that the Constitution. Second of all, if that statement wasn't the Constitution, it would be amazingly unconstitutional. <laughs> because that is the most dire statement I've ever heard in my life. Think about it. Why does it say separation of synagogue and state? Why does it say separation of mosque and state? Why does it say separation of temple and state? Church is a very specific word. When people are saying separation of church and state, they're, all, they're specifically narrowing it down to one group of people, and as Christians, we're the only ones that have church. So that would be an amazingly unconstitutional bias statement that would have to be thrown out in court the first time it was ever challenged. You can't just single out one group and say, well, you can have separation of church and state. If that's the case, well, how about separation of the temple? How about separation of mosque? How about separation of synagogue? You can't narrow out one little bitty group of people and say, no. So why do we hear that all the time? First of all, it's not even in the Constitution. Second of all, it's the most biased statement you'll ever hear. Maybe it's that spirit of Antichrist. <laughs> I remember I was having a conversation with a gentleman one time. I knew him. Uh, and he was very involved in 12 step meetings. And um, he came to me one time and he said, You know, I got a question for you, something I don't understand. Um, what's that? He says, You know, we go to 12 step meetings, we do our talking. He says, People talk about God and that's okay. People talk about their higher power and that's okay. He says, they can talk about God all they want. They can go with their higher power all they want. He says, but this moment I say, I'm talking talk about Jesus, people get mad. Well, because the spirit of Antichrist really don't care about you if you have an ashtray of your higher power. He really doesn't care how much you worship Buddha. He doesn't care how many Hindu gods you worship. He only cares about the name of Jesus. And there is a spirit in this world attacking Christianity. It's referred to as the spirit of Antichrist. And we look at a situation like that with Peter and John, and they just came on the tremendous miracle, and they're rejoicing and praising God. We think, that don't make sense. Why would they be against that? But you notice what they said. Don't preach or teach ever again in the name of Jesus. There was a wrong spirit there, immediately attacking the church. Just like there's wrong spirits out there attacking Christianity today. Amen? Acts chapter 4. So that, shifting gears. Now we understand why they acted that way. There's always a reason for behavior. But notice here in verse 24. And when they heard that, they 
lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Raised their voice to God. Now again, that may be just one of those simple phrases we can just jump right over. But it says a whole lot about it. And like I said, as a pastor, one of the things that, that you do a lot is you watch people. I watch you guys. Not in a bad way, but I observe you guys. And, and the reason I observe you is because, you know, I was telling Rachel the other day, I said, you know, I can probably know better your church attendance than you do. Because that's just stuff you do as a pastor. Why am I observing people? Because I need an understanding of where you are in your relationship with God and how to help you. Just like a doctor observes you. Why is he observing you? Because to see, there's symptoms or signs and symptoms of something. And as a pastor, you learn there's signs and symptoms of things. And so that tells you how to you understand how to pray for somebody, how you understand how to teach to them, how to minister to them, what capacity. And one of the areas that I have learned to watch very closely to tell you a whole lot is like I shared earlier, is how do you do under pressure? Somebody came to me a while back to put it in flesh and bones, bones illustration. And I was actually had been doing some marriage counseling. This is quite a while ago, this a few years ago. But, um, and, and asked me, said, Pastor, you think I should marry this person? Well, that's a pretty long question. And, you know, put a lot of weight on my shoulder because if it don't work out, see, I, you should tell me not to marry him. Uh, but, here was my answer. I said to this person, I said, you know, as a pastor, one of the things I've learned, a lot of people come into church, a lot of people just, you know, say they love God, and, you know, they want to serve God. And, and then I watch people go through some real text in life. Life's full of battles, isn't it? And when I watch people go through tests, and I watch people go through battles, and I watch people be challenged, but they just keep walking with the Lord, that tells me a lot about their relationship with God. But a lot of times people, when they face those battles, they face those tests, they face those trials, they don't keep on the Lord. They immediately go back to their old lifestyle. And when they ask me about, should I marry that person? What do you think about that person's relationship with God, Pastor? Are they sincere? I, say, I don't know. I've never really seen what tested yet. It's easy to come in and say, I love Jesus. Praise God. Woo, Lord and God, I love Jesus with all my heart. I'd do anything. I'd die for Jesus. Peter said that too, didn't he? Said Peter man ran into a test and he went he didn't even back to his old way and said, You see, so the point being is one of the things that will tell you a lot about your walk with God is what do you do when trouble strikes? What do you do under pressure? And a lot of times there's people who, you know, maybe all their life they they went numb themselves with alcohol, and the first time they come into a challenge, they go right back to Maybe they've turned to drugs all their life and they go right back to that. Maybe they've gorged themselves with chocolate. And they run right back to that. But you see, one of the first things we need to do, chocolate always makes people go on as I say that. <laughs> they might slam you. They might say, yeah, chocolate, you said chocolate! <laughs> But you see, the, the one number one thing that you have to learn as a Christian, and one of the first things you have to learn is in time of trouble, you run to God, yeah. not away from God. And that's one that seems very basic, and that seems very simple. That's one of the hardest things to teach people. Mm -hmm. Because when pressure comes, they want to push pastor away. They want to push Christians away. <clears throat> They want to run back to the old stuff because that's always been their habit of how they handle problems. <clears throat> but here they did something. They raised their voice. And they tried to do that. And when trouble comes, the number one thing for you to do is to cry out to God and to turn to God. That's the number one test you will face as a believer is who do you rely on? pressure's on. But it's important to understand something to do that. You know, I quoted the scripture a little bit earlier, Ephesians 
Since we have specifically <coughs> wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. See, we've got to understand the source of the problem. The source of the trouble. The Bible teaches us, and you hear me talk about this a lot, in what was called the parable of the sower. Where Jesus talks about the sower goes forth and sows the seed. And then all these problems come, the thorns come, and the, the harsh sun comes, and all these different problems come, the birds come and eat the seed. And then he breaks it down a little bit later and explains to us what all is taking place there. And he tells us that what happens as soon as the word of God is sown in our heart, the enemy comes. And when the enemy comes, he has different ways he attacks that word. Afflictions, persecutions, cares of this world, lust for other things, deceitfulness of riches. See, he's got all this stuff he throws at us. To try to stop us from moving forward in the things of God. To try to stop us from moving forward in the world. So we've got to understand the source of the problem. Because you see something, suddenly a light bulb will go off. If when trouble comes into your life, you automatically, wait a second, this is a spiritual problem. You see, they could have just as easily, when the, the, the powers that be came against them, said, well, we're going to take care of this, we're going to go out, we're going to get all the Christians together, and next election, second year's talk, we're going to hold you out of office. They could have went to the synagogue and said, these people are against us. We appeal to your powers. But they realize something. It's a spiritual problem here. This is a spiritual battle taking place. And if you realize that your life when trouble comes and the battles are there, that first and foremost you're fighting a spiritual battle above all else, then you're going to turn to a spiritual source for the answer. I mean, that person who runs back to the alcohol obviously doesn't know he's dealing with the devil. That person who runs back to drugs obviously doesn't know he's dealing with the devil. That person who runs to chocolate doesn't know they're dealing with the devil. I know you guys like chocolate, but the devil don't fear it. You see, one of the first things we've got to realize is that who, who is the source of the problem. And then we've got to understand God's will of the problem. Do you know the Bible tells us in Psalm 34, verse 19, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. So we ought to understand, in, in the heat of the battle, the problem is the devil. The answer is God. And God's desire and God's will in that situation is to deliver you from that affliction. God's will and God's desire for that situation is for you to walk in victory. So we realize that the power of the problem is the devil, and the answer is God. And when we realize something as simple as that, then we're more than likely to turn to God in the time of the battle. But the enemy likes us when he's coming against us all the time, and we're always seeking for worldly solutions. And we're always looking for worldly answers. Amen? Amen. You remember... In the Bible, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember when uh, was it Nebuchadnezzar told him that they built the golden idol and told him that everybody had to fall down and worship the golden idol? And if they didn't, they're going to be cast into the fire. And they didn't do it. They got cast into the fire. And they didn't, as a matter of fact, said, well, I'll give you another chance. I didn't do it the first time. I'll give you another chance. Go ahead and fall down. If you don't do that, I'm going to crank the heat up seven times. Now, they had a spiritual problem. And they needed a spiritual answer. Yes. They needed a miracle from God. And they were cast into the fire and God protected them miraculously. They came to that without harm. You know, and, and the same thing with Daniel. And when he was cast into the lion's den, you know, and, and it, because they, were, they made a law that he couldn't pray to God and he prayed anyway. That was that spirit of Antichrist. Funny, well, you can't pray to God. But what happened? He was cast into the den of lions, and God sent an angel and stopped the mouth of the lion, so he went through that slept through that night harmlessly. Now we, we have all these accounts of this in, in, in the Bible, you know, with, with uh, little David slaying Goliath. It was a spiritual battle. Little David didn't beat up the giant. He understood that behind the source there was a spiritual battle. That's why he said he came to him in the name of God. You 
see, beloved, one of the first things we've got to understand is the source of the problem. And there was a reason behind the behavior. There was a spirit there at work. There was a devil there at work, so to speak. There was a kingdom there at work. And so they came together and they prayed. And as simple as that is, as simple as that is, as simple as that is, that is really the answer in times of trouble. As a nation, we face all kinds of crazy stuff, don't we? We're trying to pass laws and do this and do that and do this and do that and, 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 and all this stuff. And, you know, and, and the gun control and all of that, and that doesn't fix it. You know, somebody came the other day and said, you know, I think we ought to outlaw guns. We wouldn't have this. I said, that's a good idea. Why don't we outlaw cocaine, too? How about heroin? Let's make heroin illegal, too. Oh, wait, it is, and people still do it. The problem is people. problem is the heart of man and the spirit is behind it. The answer is prayer. The answer is turning to God with all of our hearts in a time of trouble. I've always loved Second Chronicles chapter 20. And those who can listen to me much know how to refer to this quite often. And, and that's with Jehoshaphat. He was surrounded by the enemy. And, and cried out, you know, let's have a time of prayer and fasting. And they began to seek God and call out to God. And God spoke to them through a prophet. So you know the battle's not yours. Just march into that battle praising God and worshiping me. And God says, I'll take care of it. And he did. The enemy slayed themselves right there before Israel. You see, there's a great teaching there, a great principle for us. Beloved, in times of trouble, turn to God with all of your heart. And cry out to God with all of your heart. Seek God with all of your heart. Because behind the trouble is a spirit. And the only answer to a spiritual battle is God. That makes sense so far? With me so far? That was a common thing throughout the scriptures. That they turned to God. I forget how many times I, I, I they, it, it just in the book of Acts, we see that every time they came against time of trouble, they turned with all their heart to God. Throughout the Old Testament, when they came into trouble, they turned with all their heart to God. You know, and, and, and that's just, you know, one thing I've learned in my life, that any time trouble comes, if there's anything I've learned, is to turn to God in prayer and call upon Him. And beloved, that age-old answer is still the solution of life. It's a spiritual battle. And we need a spiritual answer. Amen? And you notice here, let me go back to one last point. Acts chapter 4. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that it meant. With one accord. With one accord. Now, that in and of itself has to be a miracle. Amen? Because people don't do much of anything in one court, do they? They don't do much of anything in harmony. And, you know, I, I thought I'd read that. And that's, again, something that's very important to God and very important to understand the Word of God. That is something, again, that it's mentioned over and over and over and over throughout the book of Acts, that the church was in one court. And there's only one way that the, that the body of Christ can be together in one court. And that is if we're following the same spirit. Amen? Because if I ask if I'm doing what I want to do, and you're doing what you want to do, and Joe Smith is doing what he wants to do, we're not going to do anything of one accord. We're not going to do anything of one heart. We're not going to do anything of one mind. But yet I've seen the Spirit of God come over people. And I've seen people in praise and worship just begin to worship God in one accord. I've seen people gather together to pray, and the Spirit of God move and come over people, and then begin to pray and call upon God in one accord. You see, beloved, that's something when we turn to God and we look to God and we surrender ourselves to His Spirit, submit ourselves to His Spirit, and allow Him to flow and move in our lives, and then we begin to function in one accord, in one heart, in one mind. You know, the, the classic examples like that, day, you can take a thousand guitars and tune them to one piano, and all of those thousand guitars are perfectly tuned together. Every one of them. So if we're tuned to the same Spirit, then we should be functioning in one accord. 
If we're tuned to the same word, then we should be functioning in one heart and one mind, shouldn't we? But then again, if you take the guitar and you tune each guitar to the next guitar, none of them will be in tune. If I take a guitar and it's a perfect tune, and then somebody else takes a guitar and tunes it to my guitar, somebody else takes a guitar and tunes it to their guitar, somebody else takes a guitar and tunes it to their guitar, somebody else takes a guitar and tunes it to their guitar, by the time they're done, all the guitars are out of whack. Because there's a slight variation in each one. And if we tune the guitar to the same piano, then they'll all be in tune. What's the point? We can't be in one accord because we're in tune with each other. We can be in one accord when we're all in tune with God. When we're tuned to the same source, then we're in one heart, one mind, and one accord. So a group of people came together. And even though it was probably a large group, they were all focused on God. They were all calling upon God. They were all listening to God. And as a result of being tuned into God, they were functioning as one unit. They weren't looking to each other. Amen? So the point of today's teaching, realize in your trouble, there's a spiritual battle. And turn to God with all of your heart. And don't look to the things of this world as your answer or your solution. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I just thank you and I praise you this morning, Father, and I worship your holy name. Truly you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the most high God, and I exalt you this morning. Father, I pray for each and every one of us this morning, Father God, that Lord, you will take your word, you will speak to our hearts, Father. You will take your word, Father God, today and speak to our lives, Father. And Lord God, I pray for that understanding today. I pray for that revelation today, Father God, in each and every one of our lives that truly the battles of this life are spiritual battles. And we may not see that on the surface all the time, Lord, but it is that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And Father God, if we have that understanding, Lord God, we understand who you are, Father. And Lord God, the heart you have of love and mercy and grace. And Father God, the desire of your heart, Father God, is to deliver us from all of those afflictions, Father God. And Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for that, Father. And Lord, we would have that understanding today, Father God, to turn to you, Father, with all of our heart. And even now, Father God, in this season that we live, Father God, this time we live of turmoil and chaos, Father God, in the world, Father God, that we would turn our hearts to you, Father God, and realize you're the only answer, Father God. You're the only solution, Father. And Lord, I thank you, and I praise you for that today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Caleb, you want to come help me? Tonight, Amelia will be here to do worship. Next Sunday, the praise.